podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Bobby Rains here for our once every three weeks Investors Observer Members Only Workshop. Um, so, yeah, let's get started. All right. Our agenda today, we have some announcements about what's going on here at Investors Observer, uh, an update about what's going on in the stock market, and then the rest of the time is member-driven content, questions, site demonstrations, etc. We got some questions ahead of time this week. Uh, thank you to anyone who submitted those. Um, as always, I can prepare things ahead of time. If you get that invitation email, you can just reply to it and say, hey, can you talk about this? You can also send us an email using the help button on the website at any point um, and just mention, you know, the workshop or the webinar in there. Um, and we could do that, uh, you know, you can submit those that way as well. All right. So what's going on, Investors Observer? Yesterday we launched our new stock dashboard. Um, I'll go through it on the site as well in a second. But um, essentially we pulled over the top level information from the My Portfolio feature onto that dashboard, put the market sentiment indicator that had been only available on the options dashboard on the stock dashboard now. So now um, those of you who don't have an option subscription will be able to see that. Um, the watch lists remain on the dashboard, although there is some custom news and other things that we'll talk about in a second. Um, we added pre-built screens to the dashboard. The screener itself has been moved off of the dashboard just because we wanted to sort of devote that real estate somewhere else, but it is still on the site. Um, and then, yeah, those personalized news features from there. All right, so let's go. All right, so this is the new stock dashboard. Um, I use the site in light mode. It's just a habit at this point, but yeah, that's where we are. Okay, so we still have your top fives. Um, the My Portfolio is over here. The Market Sentiment Indicator, today we landed at bullish. Um, your watch lists are here. I don't have a lot of watch lists uh, on this account, um, but they're there. And it'll show a list of watch lists here, and then you can expand them to see all the stocks in them. And then the market chart is here. Um, the latest news, so we have latest news is this first category. And then we have, you can see news for all of your watch lists, or you'll also have a little tab like this for specific news from each individual watch list that you may have. Um, so if you have a bunch of watch lists, or you just wanna see news on specific stocks, uh, you know, you could do this that way. All right, so let's come back up and talk about these preset screeners. So you can see the stock screener from that button. It's also available in the stocks dropdown. Um, but then we put together some screens to sort of help people find a few things. Um, these are, you know, mostly pretty self-explanatory in terms of like high volume tech stocks, high volume healthcare stocks, solar specs. We tried to break out some sectors and industries people might be interested in. Um, and then we put together some custom ones like top stocks under $10. Um, so here we found stocks under $10 that had high overall scores and, you know, at least a fundamental score, which means there's some, some fundamental information available on the stock. Um, you know, Big Mo is our, uh, you know, momentum stocks, basically, right? So stocks that are going up, we look for high sentiment, high short-term technical scores. Um, and that's those. And then we've got a couple for, you know, value. So here's some stocks that don't have particularly attractive, you know, sort of long-term technicals. The Even the overall scores aren't very high, but they do pretty well on the, uh, you know, the valuation metrics. Um, so that's what some of these are. We got a similar, sort of similar one for deep value. On the rebound is stocks that have been beaten up and look like they, they might be starting to turn the corner there. Um, so we kind of wanted to give you a way to, you know, a, a shortcut into the screener instead of having to figure out how it works, um, you know, yourself. You can, uh, you can sort of use those shortcuts there. So, you know, if you have suggestions about other things you'd like to see, Either a suggestion of how to build the, the screener in terms of what scores to use or just to like, oh, hey, um, how would I screen for this? Uh, you know, send us that also and we can, um, you know, we can try to add those. We do. We definitely, I mean, we obviously have real estate here, um, but we can uh, we can try to try to accommodate some some requests there as well. 
All right, so let's get back to the slides here. All right, so this is the one year daily candles chart that we typically look at. Um, I think our last workshop was, oh, hang on. This is the wrong chart. Okay, well, we'll skip that because that's the wrong image. Um, I forgot to put the new image in there. All right, in any case, the uh, yeah, the market has done much better since our last workshop than it did in the couple weeks heading into that, uh, that workshop. Um, so this is the S&P 500 versus the S&P 500 equal weight over the past month. Um, you can see the equal weight has, has outperformed a little bit. Um, the S&P is actually down and the equal weight is down less. Um, all right, so then we broke out some other stocks here. Uh, to, to sort of show the, the like reopen versus um, you know the 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 continuing pandemic trade. So this is Disney versus Netflix, which we've looked at a couple times here. Um, this you know this day where they just went in opposite directions was the uh, the Pfizer vaccine announcement, um, and then this other day where Disney popped up and uh, Netflix didn't do anything was the uh, Moderna vaccine announcement. Um, Delta and Zoom is another one that's pretty, pretty, pretty striking in terms of you know uh, reopen trade, and then the virus news kind of gets bad, and they come back together, and then you get some more positive vaccine news, and they pop out and go apart again. Um, all right, so what else is happening? Uh, the election is over. Um, I don't really expect we'll hear much about politics in the financial world, at least in that regard, um, until probably sometime leading up to the, the January 5 runoff elections in Georgia for the Senate. Um, that's probably going to decide who controls the Senate, so it should be um, you know, interesting. I would expect there might be some new volatility ahead of that data or ahead of those dates. Um, but there's lots of other things going on at that point as well. You've got sort of, you know, year in trading and a bunch of stuff like that going on. So I don't know if it will uh, have much impact on the actual overall market as well. Um, there is some potential for what I'm calling here sort of lame duck volatility in the sense of, right? Um, we're not really sure what the president may try to accomplish or not accomplish. Uh, he's still president for two months. Um, so what he does in that time is sort of a mystery. Um, I don't think anybody was really expecting him to like, you know, uh, announce tariffs on China by tweet, um, which is a thing that happened early in, uh, early in the term. So we'll see what happens, um, as things go on here. All right. So, I mean, just generally though, yeah, coronavirus is still the, uh, the name of the game economy wise cases are rising again cold weather is likely to push more spending online um this is typically good for big businesses which have a more robust online presence um and less good for smaller businesses which tend to not have a particularly robust online presence um the vaccine does provide some light at the end of the tunnel right i mean you could see in those last couple of charts the you know Things that have been beaten up like Disney or an airline um, rallied on that news. Um, but sort of in the meantime, right, like we are, in fact, still in the tunnel, right? So new lockdowns are happening. Um, data from back in the spring showed that people don't really need lockdowns to stay home. So, um, you know, I mean, there was some, some comparison in terms of, um, you know, what... Uh, what what in-person credit card activity, which was a good way to track sort of how much people were leaving their houses looked like. And it was pretty much lined up whether you lived in a state that had a lockdown or didn't because people, yeah, people cut way back on their in-person, um, you know, sort of spending uh, at that point. 
Um, and yeah, the, the transition could be pretty rough for pandemic plays. Um, when we looked at that Zoom chart a while ago, it doesn't look great since the vaccine announcements. Um, and Zoom is still up more than 500% this year. I think they have a PE ratio that's also somewhere north of 500%. Um, Peloton is up 270%. Like these stocks are absolutely priced for, uh, <clears throat> you know, continuing really high growth and so if that looks like it's going to stop at some point you know soonish let's say um that you know presents a, a particular risk for those you know those two stocks in particular i mean some of the other things right apple is up quite a bit this year but its valuation doesn't look nearly as crazy as like Zoom and Peloton are the two that I, I mentioned here because they're particularly crazy. Even some of the other ones like Netflix and Roku, there may be issues with those underlying businesses there, but they're, yeah, the they're just much less crazy in terms of how uh, how stretched and far they've they've gone this year. All right, so getting into some of the other economic data that we've been looking at, um, this has gotten really interesting. So this hump here was Prime Day. And then it went sort of down as expected. And then, oh, we're not, yeah, I mean, this just sort of seemed like people cutting back on spending. It was kind of broadly across categories um, as coronavirus cases started to rise. And then I'm not really sure what to make of this new leg up unless it is, you know, potentially a pre-Thanksgiving bump. There's also been some anecdotal reports about shortages of various staples in grocery stores as people do some, I don't know, you can call it hoarding or just stocking up ahead of some perceived lockdowns. It's really hard to know um, exactly what that is. The category where that spending is, according to this JP Morgan report, is like wholesalers, which is like your Costco's and Sam Clubs and supermarkets. So it's really hard to break out if it's like early Thanksgiving spending or some stocking up in preparation of lockdowns. Um, I mean, it's nice to see it get back to sort of on trend as opposed to keep going down, but it it seems like it's caused by something and I'm not really sure what at this juncture anyway. All right, so from the TSA, we had this weirdly symmetrical bump around Labor Day here and then started to roll over again. I think our last workshop was somewhere in, in this area. Um, you know, we've bottomed out and sort of science seems to be creeping back up again, but it's definitely, you know, down from where it was a month ago. Um, and still just seems to be a real slow grind back to anywhere. Um, we don't see much movement here. I do wonder if some of this uptick could be people traveling for the holiday. I know it's a week from tomorrow, but with people working from home and going to school from home, I do wonder if there may be some stretch of the travel season since people don't, yeah. Turns out if you're working from home and going to school from home, you don't actually have to do it from home. You could do it from anywhere. So people may try to travel early to beat the rush, the people who are still traveling anyway. Um, and this is the daily rate of change in that seven day average. You can see it was pretty steadily declining for a while and it's come back up to be, you know, sort of a touch over break even on, on most days. Um, all right, so that's our economic discussion um, and what's going on in the market. And now into the questions. All right, so this question came from Garth and he said, what kind of beast have I created in these options? Um, sold to open a Pepsi, call sold to open a pepsi put um and then there is a yeah some i don't know if i cut it out when i edited the question here or not but there's this sold call implies some number of uh you know shares held too um so it's kind of hard to say what this is and yeah, the strike prices are, are the same here. Um, so this is probably if I had to describe it as one thing, it's a covered short straddle. Um, that doesn't seem to be a strategy that very many people use by that name, um, but essentially selling, yeah, selling options at roughly the same strike price. 
um, a call and a put is a short straddle. Um, another way to look at this is basically it's a covered call with an extra sold put. Um, so the sold put adds some extra profit to the covered call if the covered call works, but it can have some significant downside risks. Um, and the reason for that is a covered call and a short put are basically the same trade. So if you think about a covered call, you don't have a ton of upside there, right? Your upside is capped at basically wherever the strike price of that sold call is. Um, but in exchange for capping that, you get the extrinsic value from that call, um, which gives you, since you own the stock anyway, a lower cost basis. So the potential to own the stock at some price lower than the current price. Um, a sold put, <coughs> excuse me, gives you the extrinsic value from the option you sold and the potential to own the stock at some lower price than the current price because the potential negative outcome from a sold put is the stock falls and you have to buy the stock at the strike price of the sold put and then your cost basis becomes the stri that strike price minus the credit you got for selling the put. So if you look at these two trades on a P&L chart, they're basically the same trade. Now, some people like to do sold puts above, you know, in a, as opposed to covered calls because, you know, if you're trading in a margin account, you may not need to put the entire amount from zero to the strike price, um, you know, in in cash. Uh, whereas if you're going to buy 100 shares of stock, you you know, kind of have to do that in cash. Um, I suppose you do that in a margin, but yeah, generally that's that's the reason people do that. You can also, you know, in times where you know, earning interest on cash is a thing. You can earn interest on cash with a sold put, whereas you can't on a on a covered call. Um, so those are the reasons for that. But yeah, they're functionally the same trade in terms of like what the risks are. So I mean, yeah, it, it sort of technically is a covered short straddle, but basically it's a covered call and a sold put side by side. And really what you've done is basically just sort of double your exposure to Pepsi in that way. All right, so another question from Garth. Uh, explain diagonal spreads. And he specifically had a question about a Pepsi diagonal spread. So this, this actually uses the trade from yesterday just because I could update it and get um, use those prices. So the trade is basically you buy a put that expires in April at a 125 strike, sell one that expires in January at a 145 strike, um, and your net debit for that is going to be 1760, which is the amount you paid to buy the call less the amount you brought in from selling the call. Okay, so 1760 is how much you pay to get in. Um, that's obviously cheaper than buying Pepsi, which is somewhere around 145. Um, and the way this works is a diagonal spread is often called a synthetic covered call. It's a relatively similar. Um, Yeah, it's a relatively similar trade in the sense that the way you're making money is from selling an option. Um, right, so the extrinsic value for that sold option is most of the profit in this trade, um, especially the way that these are structured here with the, uh, the sold call very close to the, the current price. Um, and so the sold call creates potentially the obligation to sell the stock at 145, which is exactly what happens in a covered call. Um, you don't own the stock though, um, but you buy an option which allows you to buy the stock at 125. So if you were to do both of those things at the same time, right, buy the stock at 125, sell the stock at 145, you get 20 bucks, right? I mean, if you buy something for 125 and sell it for 145, that's 20 bucks. Okay. So if you paid 1760 to get 20 bucks, you get Right, your target profit there is 240, which is a 13% return. Um, I can't do the math in my head, but a 240 return on a covered call on Pepsi at 145 is going to be a lot lower. Um, yeah, it's going to be a, a lot lower in terms of the uh, you know that simple percentage there. Um, and the thing about this is you don't actually have to exercise assign the options. Um, the market recognizes the value of the position and will let you sell it uh, for 20 bucks or sometimes a little bit more even um, once expiration gets close 
or if the sold option gets to be in the money by to some degree. So if Pepsi goes way up before January, you can probably close this for something pretty close to 20 bucks early. Um, and the reason we like this as opposed to say a vertical debit spread is this option doesn't expire until April. So if Pepsi is below 145 for whatever reason, um, you know, say there's a global pandemic or something else that disrupts the stock market, and the trade doesn't perform as you're expecting, um, you can sell another call against it, which is going to lower this 1760. Um, and I mean, if you can sell another one at 145, all you've done at that point is you just raise the target profit. Um, so yeah, that's that is uh, the the quick pitch for diagonal spreads. All right, so Joni asked, when should I be taking profits when selling puts and calls? Is it best to take a percentage or look at some technical indicators to determine when? If it's technical indicators, which one? So selling an option is essentially opening a short position on the option, um, right? So the goal of all short sales is the price of the shorted security to drop. So, um, you know, obviously the most it's going to drop is to zero. At that point, it can't drop anymore. Um, so the thing is, options lose value over time, but it's not linear, right? They don't lose the same amount or even the same percent every day. The amount of premium that's lost in options accelerates the faster you get, the closer you get to expiration. Um, and this is simply because... <clears throat> that option premium is a measure of, we'll call it the uncertainty around um, around the price of the underlying stock at some point in the future. Um, okay, and so if you're measuring that uncertainty, it's not, right, like taking off one day doesn't remove one unit of uncertainty, it removes some percentage of the time. Um, and so the most time you can remove in terms of units is, well, I guess the most you could remove is 100%. But if you go from two days to expiration, from two, from two days to expiration to one day to expiration, you've removed 50% of the time. Whereas if you go from a week to four days, you've removed 20% of the time. So you may expect 20% of the time value to leak out going from five to four, whereas, 50% of the existing time value leaks out from two to one. Okay, so that that loss accelerates. Um, and so if the op price of the option has fallen really fast because the underlying stock has moved, you may wanna consider closing early for that reason. Okay, so if you're, you know, you sold an option and the price to buy it back is like a nickel or something like that. Um, and a lot of the brokers, well, I guess, yeah, most of them don't have trading fees anyway at this point. Um, but at a certain point, yeah, the broker would just close it for you or let you close it commission free for a nickel or I think some of them might have been a dime. Um, so you may want to close early for that reason, just because if there's significant time left, the stock could move back against you um, in some way. But um, otherwise, right, because you don't make 50% of the profit and 50% of the time, um, closing early will frequently lower both the actual and the annualized return, right? So if you close it in half the time and you only made 40% of the profit, you're not going to have the same actual return, obviously, but you're also not going to have, you're also going to have a lower annualized return doing that. Um, so again, right, if the stock moves, you know, pretty strongly in one direction or the other and the price of the option actually falls significantly, um, then it can make sense to close it early, but otherwise, it, you know, it doesn't necessarily make a ton of sense. Um, all right, so Elena asked, could you organize a class to teach us how to exit spreads, which some examples you need to know how to calculate the profit? So um, Elena was asking specifically here about credit spreads, which is also essentially a kind of short sale, right? You're a net seller of options, right? You sell an expensive option and buy a less expensive option. So again, the most you can make here is the full amount of the credit. And you do that by having the value of the options go to zero. Um, closing early will always mean you're making something smaller than the maximum profit. 
Um, and yeah, the maximum amount you can make from a credit spread is that full credit. So determining the profit and loss, it, it can get weird with credit spreads because you get a credit up front, but you still have some at risk amount that's sort of implied as opposed to being explicit in terms of, right? Like if I buy a stock for 20 bucks, I know I have risked 20 bucks. If I sell some options and I get a dollar back, it can be harder to determine how much I have at risk. Um, typically what you have at risk in a credit spread is the width of the strikes minus that credit. So if it's $5 between strike prices and you got a credit up front of a dollar, you have $4 at risk. Okay, so to determine the profit and loss when you're exiting a credit spread early, it's essentially just the amount you pay to close the trade minus that initial credit. So if you open a trade for a $1 credit and you get out for 50 cents, you made 50 cents, right? Got paid a dollar, paid back 50 cents, you got 50 cents left. If you open a trade for a $1 credit and close it for a $1.50 debit, because you had to pay to get a buck fifty to get out, now you lost 50 cents. That's that's how that works. All right, so Reggie said, what do you think about the VIX? It's created two hammers and it's below the 20 day moving average. Do I think it will retest the 20 day moving average? All right, so this is a 90 day chart of the VIX. At 90 days, it's not a particularly bullish chart, but it doesn't look super different from a regular stock chart. Okay. So let's go to a longer period of time, 20 years. This does not look like any stock chart you've ever seen, right? There's no stock that shoots up and then drops back down and shoots up and then drops back down and spends most of its time between, let's call it 10 and 16, right? Like stocks don't trade like that. Um, all right, and so then here's the last two years and that 20 day moving average put in there. Okay, so once it starts falling, typically it stays below the 20 day moving average unless there's another volatility event. Um, I, I, I personally am not a direct volatility trader. I mean, in some, in some regard, right? Like trading covered calls and things like that, you're, you end up being short volatility because selling options, you're essentially selling option premium. You want that price to go down. That's a short trade. And what you're short is functionally volatility at that level. So in a sort of indirect way, we, we trade volatility here, but it's not a thing that I do directly just because it's, you know, um, look at this chart. Who wants to trade this? Um, right? Like it's, it's flat except for when it's absolutely vertical in one way or the other. Um, See, so yeah, I don't, I don't think technical analysis really works on the VIX. Um, because technical analysis is based in sort of behavioral economics, right? People talk, you know, technical and technical people use phrases like price has memory, right? That's how support and resistance work. Um, well, the VIX isn't actually a price. No one can trade the VIX directly. There are ETFs on the VIX. I think there's some futures on the VIX, but the VIX is actually calculated from prices on options on the S&P 500. And so essentially what it's measuring is the amount of risk premium that is built into those options. Um, and so price has memory, but in a, you know, I mean, we've all seen, we can go back to the beginning of this presentation and look at the, you know, S&P 500 or some other stock chart, um, right? They typically move sort of up and to the right, right? The prices get higher as time goes on. Well, this is pretty flat as time goes on um, because it's not a price actually, it's an average of some things. Um, and so it's mean reverting. It always comes back down to somewhere around this average price. Um, so I don't, I don't really think that it being below the 20 day moving average really means that much. And I don't think that, yeah, I don't think that hammers are really a sign of a bottom in this case because it's right. It's n those, those candlesticks, you can get a candlestick chart on the VIX. I, you know, put one right here. Um, 
but that's not a uh, yeah. Though there there aren't there's not money changing hands to make those candles. It's just somebody doing math based on option prices for near the money you know near the money options on the s p 500 it's not a it's not a thing where technical analysis really works all right so that's all of the prepared questions all right all right so rajesh says he said what is the best screener for swing trades um Rajesh, probably something like that momentum screen, or there's also one um, let me back out here. I guess it depends on it kind of depends on how you swing trading. Um, right. So something like on the rebound might be a way to look for swings, right? Because this is something that's been going down that looks like it's turning around. Um, or you know, um, the momentum is an, is another one um, that that you could look for there uh, as well. Um, those are the two I would I would recommend in terms of what we have so far. And I don't off the top of my head, I don't. Yeah, yeah, just just on the spot like this, I don't have a better idea um, that comes to mind immediately. All right. So Rajesh says, can we look at Zoom and Peloton? So yeah, I mean. Zoom is, you know, started to pull back a little bit here, but it's just bananas. Um, and if you get into this, some stuff here, I mean, the, yeah, the PE ratio is over 500. Um, and a healthy PE ratio is, historically, people have said around 15. I think the PE for the whole S&P 500 right now is about 30, which is a little bit stretched. Um, you would expect that to, to go down as earnings start to come back up uh, post pandemic. Uh, the peg ratio is eight, where a healthy peg ratio is usually considered to be around one. Um, this is a stock that's priced for just continued, uh, you know, absolutely bananas growth. And I'm not sure I see the case for that, um, you know, right now. Um, I mean, I'm not sure. Given where we are in the world after eight months of, you know, people quarantining and staying home and online school and people not traveling for work, I'm not sure who's not using Zoom now that's going to be using it in six months. Um, but I can imagine a lot of people who are using Zoom who won't be using it in six months because maybe they've gotten a vaccine and they can get on an airplane for a business meeting or something like that. So. I don't think Zoom is going to go back to its pre-pandemic levels. I think they've added a lot of customers that they're going to hang on to. Um, but I have a hard time seeing them continuing that growth trajectory, um, you know, too much further into the future. And Peloton, Peloton is interesting, um, but it's kind of a similar story. If we look at the year-to-date chart here, it's yeah, not that different from Zoom. I guess it peaked in October, but also had a big drop around the vaccine announcements. Um, and yeah, I mean, Peloton has some interesting things going on. They have a subscription that's attached to the bike. So, you know, even if they're not, even if the sale of bikes slows, they can still sell more subscriptions. Um, I think they're trying to get into gyms, which will be a thing once gyms reopen. Um, and their valuation is, I mean, significantly less crazy in the sense of a PE of 300 as opposed to a PE of 500. Um, but that's still like 10 times the the market. Um, this is a stock that is priced for, again, right? Like just absolute continuing super fast growth. Um, and I'm not sure, I'm not 100% convinced I really see the case for it. Um, I mean, I guess this has a, you know, the mean target is up 24% um, over the next 12 months, but 24% over the next 12 months is, um, yeah, seems small compared to something like 200, you know, more than 
year to date in 2020. All right, so Jose asked, are iron condors less risky than selling naked puts? Um, that's sort of an interesting question, Jose. Um, so let's go look at, oh, let's see here. Let's just look at Peloton while we're here. All right, Peloton does have an iron condor. Okay, so um, it's an interesting question because this Peloton put here, the amount at risk as we calculate it is going to be $98.07. Okay. And that's because you get $3.94 for selling the put. The put price is 102. Take 394 from 102 and you get, uh, there's a fraction in there that makes this not work out exactly right, but you get 98.07. Um, right. But you only lose 9807 if Peloton goes to zero. Um, okay, and if Peloton keeps going up, you don't lose anything. You make 394. On the Iron Condor, you're betting here that the stock is going to stay between 105 and 101. Um, here, we'll pull up all the legs here. Okay, so you're betting that it's going to stay between these two sold legs. So it's going to stay between 105 and 101. And now the most you can lose is a buck 19 um, against a you know a target profit of 181. Um, but your chances of losing that 119 are a lot higher, right? Because the stock only has to go to either 98. Or 108, and you're totally wiped out here, um, right? So in terms of the, in terms of losing a large percentage of what you have at risk, the naked put is a lot safer, just because the chances of you know the chances of Peloton being cut by 50 percent are a lot smaller than the chance of Peloton moving by like 10 percent. Um, but in terms of losing a large number of dollars, well, your risk at the iron condor is capped at 119. Whereas, you know, I guess if all the Pelotons caught on fire and the company went bankrupt, um, the stock would go to zero. And then you just lost, you know, $98 as opposed to a buck 19. Um, it seems unlikely to lose the whole 98. I mean, we've been doing the covered calls portfolio here for yev forever. And I've never had a stock go to zero in that portfolio, right? It just, it doesn't happen. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it really sort of depend, depends on how you want to measure the risk. Um, all right, so Dan asked if we can provide some sources or recommendations for options education. So, um, we do have some art, some option stuff in our help center in terms of getting started. Um, you know, both how to use the service, which is this option products basis, and then just a whole bunch of like definitions and stuff about options here. Um, these workshops are another thing I would you know recommend if you want like sort of a course. Um, they changed their URL, so give me a second. I don't think that's it. Nope. Nope. All right, we'll just Google it. Ah, optionseducation.org. It used to be 1-800-OPTIONS was their, their website for a long time. But um, yeah, having your website be a phone number stopped making sense a long time ago. So yeah, optionseducation.org. This is the Options Industry Council. They're not really trying to sell anything. Um, some of these classes may have a fee, but I don't think they do. They have a lot of good educational materials. And yeah, they're they're not trying to sell you anything. Um, they're just a, uh, you know, sort of a, a public interest organization that um, is trying to educate people about options. So that's, that's the other educational source that I would really recommend. Um, we do not currently have the data to give a screen for like stocks with a high short float. Um, it's just, yeah, it's just not data we have right now. Um, I don't, 
offhand, I don't know a good a good free place to get that either. It's yeah, typically that data is delayed um, anyway. So when you look at it, it may not be uh, it may not be accurate at the time that you're seeing it. All right. Are there any other questions? All right, so I got a few minutes here. I can wait and see if more questions come in. Um, while I'm waiting, though, uh, this workshop, like all of our workshops, is being recorded. Um, we'll send out a recording or a link to watch the recording and also a link to download the slides from today um, sometime tomorrow. Uh, if you have questions between workshops, we're more than happy to help at this button here. Um, just put in your name and an email address and a question and we'll get back to you. You can also call us at the phone number found in the footer of the website there. Uh, we're open eight to, um, you know, eight to five business days. All right, so Lana says, which technical indicators do you use for trading options? Um, you know, it really sort of depends, and I, I'm not even sure. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure what we do here. Most of the time, would I would even put into the category of technical indicator, right? Um, we're not doing a lot of you know fancy Bollinger bands or you know some of the some of those things, right? We're not reading a lot of candlesticks or you know looking at Fibonacci fans or or any of that. Um, but generally, what we're doing is trying to look for right almost all of the strategies here are bets that a stock will be essentially slightly higher than it is now or somewhat lower than it is now in a few weeks um and so most of the time what we're looking for is a chart that's not crazy in the sense of like well peloton may be a decent example here um Right, like this is starting to look like a downtrend. I'm probably not going to want to put a bullish bet on Peloton right now until I see it turn around. Um, okay, so something like that. You know, if you do look for something, you want to you want to try to have some some resistance where you know where it is, where you're not going to not really going to lose things. But at the same time, I don't want to find something that's just you know shooting to the moon and try to put a trade on that because those things typically tend to come back. So what I'm looking at more than any particular indicator is what I would call consistency. Right? I mean, the, the perfect stock chart to me is a, a line that goes up at somewhere around 45 degrees, right? Like it doesn't get too hot, doesn't get cold, just kind of drifts higher over time. That's a great stock for trading options because the stock is relatively predictable. Um, and that's what you're doing when you're trading options is you're betting on where a stock will be in the future. And if you're going to do that, you want things to be predictable. Um, yeah. That is that. All right. Can we go through the option screener? Absolutely. All right, so the option screener is a little bit different from a stock screener in the sense that, um, you know, you have to start by picking an option strategy. Um, so we can start with covered calls here. And then from there, you can put in as many or as few criteria as you want. You can also just sort by, um, you know, columns if you want. So if you want to find the shortest trades or the longest trades, just click the top of that column. Click it twice if you want to see the longest ones. Um, 
right? But you can also use the screener. So if you just don't want trades that last very long, pick a date a few weeks out, maybe we'll say the 24th there. Um, you know, for covered calls, you probably are going to want to keep an eye on that net debit. So we'll say we don't want anything that's going to cost us more than 80 bucks. Covered calls, again, we want something that's drifting upwards probably. So I usually use an overall score of about 55. Key rating, um, this is our evaluation of the option trade. It does not include an evaluation of the stock. So you can find a, a thing that has a low key rating and a high stock score or a high stock score and a low key rating. So the key rating is about, with covered calls in particular, about the defensibility of the position, right? So if you're gonna get a relatively small credit and the strikes are really wide and the trade is gonna be open for months, that's not a particularly attractive trade. But if you can get a relatively large credit compared to the strike widths, and it's also going to be relatively short, that's that's something we're going to be into. So we'll say four or higher for keys. Um, and yeah, that takes us down to 76. And then, yeah, from there, you can sort by the keys or something like that. Um, and then, yeah, you can see the details of any trade by clicking the details button. You can go to the page for a stock by clicking the name of the stock um so that's that's how that works that's basically how it works for everything um you know some of the spreads are a little bit different in the sense of like the the credit spreads in particular um right like the amount at risk is never over five dollars um all of our all of our credit spreads are five dollars or narrower um, so that, that field just sort of becomes less relevant. Um, obviously if you're going to do bearish trades, you'd probably want a lower overall score and still a high key rating. Um, you know, you can, if you, yeah, if you like trading tech stocks, you can do that. Um, if you have some particular piece of a thing you want to trade, you can hit this expander and get the industries in that sector. Um, But yeah, that's that's how the option screener works. Um, and yeah, we tried to put as much of the information as we could here. It gets a little unwieldy, with the, especially with the spreads, with a lot of columns, and then also having to give a expiration and strike for everything. But you can pop out the details here, or you can click through and see everything on the uh, actual individual stock page. All right, so under the news section, are you planning to add a tab for filtering unusual options activity for each trading day? Um, not currently. Uh, if you go to the options, yeah. If you go to the options dashboard, uh, you can find that in our, um, yeah, you can find the unusual options activity in our investors keyhole trades when we write them. Um, but yeah, that's, yeah. We don't usually have a lot of unusual options activity content. Um, it's about one thing per day. Um, and if you're subscribed to that, you can also get it by email. Just go to my account. And then under investors keyhole, you can turn the rest of them off if you only care about the unusual options activity. Um, but yeah, just hit that guy. Um, and then remember to save, to save your settings. And that's that. All right, so Dan says, when is the best time to do options analysis? Um, I'm not, 
a hundred percent sure I understand this question. Um, right. So, I mean, generally the best time is when you're, yeah, when you're planning to trade because, yeah, because the stock market moves around a lot and then options are, you know, a derivative of that. So they move around even more than the stock market. Um, you know, the trades in our screener and stuff like that are updated overnight. So typically early morning, you know, around market open is the best time to sort of look at those things. Um, and you can adjust trades if you want after the fact. Um, you know, if a stock goes up by five dollars and you can just move the strike price by five dollars kind of a thing. Um, but yeah, other otherwise, I mean, you know, if you're doing something else, I don't know. Um, you know, I don't know that there's a best time necessarily. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't know if there's necessarily a best time of day. Um, I, most trading generally happens in the morning. Um, I mean, if you look at a, if you look at a stock chart that has a volume on it, right, there's a big surge of trading around the open and then it kind of tapers off. Um, and then there's usually a, a little bump right before the close, but yeah, most, most trading happens in the first like hour or two of trading. Um, yeah. All right. So yeah, Rajesh, Bobby's list here is literally just a list of stocks on a watch list here. And these are, yeah, that's as much a, a test of the watch list feature as, as anything else. Um, so yeah, if you have watch lists, they'll show up here um, also, but yeah, that's, that's nothing special. I, I largely use this for, for testing and, and demonstration and it's not really, uh, it's not really anything I would take much away from. All right. Um, I don't know if there are any more questions. Uh, it doesn't really seem like there are any more coming in. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up here unless. Yeah. OK. Well. Put it in there then. Yeah, I'm waiting for this last question. Somebody said they had a question, so I'm waiting for them to type it out. All uh, right, so Rajesh, I'm not sure what you mean by all the alerts. Um, I mean, in the investors keyhole trades, yeah, it's usually four. Um, they're all vertical spreads. Um, yeah, I don't have them in my email handy, but yeah, it's it's these guys right here. Um, and yeah, the trade is this, right? So the December 165, 170 bull put spread for a 30 cent credit. All right, let's sell the 170 by the 165 for not worse than 30 cents. Um, yeah, I mean, we publish four a day because, you know, they come out at different times so people can have some convenience and then otherwise it's, yeah. Yeah, otherwise it's up to you. Um, I mean, those have a pretty high win rate over time. Um, and yeah, I've been doing this long enough that, yeah. Sometimes the ones that I expect to win don't, and um, some other ones, yeah, and sometimes some ones where I'm a little less sure are actually end up winners. So yeah, I don't, I don't know that anything I would tell you on top of you know here's the four trades today is is at all at all valuable, um, right? Like we 
try to pick, pick the best trade with uh, with each and every um, with each and every one. Um, yeah, we we track that internally, but it's not it's not for public consumption. But I can tell you, it's been something like 15 years that we've been doing that, and the win rate has been between like 89 and 90 percent um, over that period. Um, Faroon, I don't know why you would have lost the ability to update a watch list. Um, you may want to send in a support ticket at this help button with, uh, with a little bit more information in terms of like what exactly happened, um, in terms of like when you lost the ability to update your watch list, what kind of behavior it has, if you have a screenshot of like the Hang on, let me go back here. Yeah, I mean, can you can you try deleting it or renaming it or something like that? Um, maybe just adding a new one. Um, you know, you can hit this button here. Should be able to let you either create a new watch list. But you can add things to like that. Um, yeah, that's how it's supposed to work. Um, so if your experience is different from that, if you could, I guess, describe more specifically what's not working, um, be glad to take a look that way. All right, so I think that is pretty much all the time we have. Um, thank you all for coming. Like I said, we'll send out this recording tomorrow. Um, if you have questions between now and the next workshop, which will be Oh, let's see, three weeks from today is about December the 9th. Um, we can go ahead and do that. Um, you know, go ahead and do that. And we, you know, there's there's no reason that I have to hold your question for three weeks. Uh, if you have a question that needs to be answered today, by all means, submit it and I'll answer it, um, you know, day off. All right. Thank you all for coming um, and I will talk to you soon.